Take your Bibles and turn with me to one of the greatest texts in all of Scripture regarding the resurrection of Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The entire chapter, all of the verses, all 58 of the verses are about Jesus being raised from the dead. You know the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. Isn't that something? And uh, one of the reasons is because it is filled with miracles. The Bible opens with a miracle. The very first verse, Genesis 1-1. Read that off the screen with me, would you please? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I would say that's a miracle, would you? And in the last chapter, Revelation chapter 22, there's another miracle, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Read that with me, please. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So the Bible begins with a miracle, and it ends with a miracle. What is a miracle? Well, the dictionary says it's a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable, that is, you don't understand it, by natural or scientific laws, and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. It goes on to say that it's a, it, has very, it brings very welcome consequences. Well, I believe that's a good d- definition of a miracle. It's a, a wonder. It's a marvel. It's a, it's a supernatural phenomenon. It's a mystery, and the Bible is filled with it. Now, what's the greatest miracle of all? Somebody said, well, I think the greatest miracle is when Moses lifted his hand and God parted the Red Sea. Well, I don't think that's the greatest miracle, but boy, that was a great miracle. What about the time that Joshua prayed and the whole world stopped turning and, uh, for a day so that they could defeat their enemies, the Amalekites and others? That was a great miracle, but that wasn't the greatest miracle of all. What about when Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Now, I don't know if he just walked up to a living donkey and pulled his jawbone out. I don't know. But I believe he killed him because it's in the Bible. That's a great miracle, but I don't think it's the greatest. What about Elijah when he called down fire from heaven? Well, that was a great miracle. What about Elisha who took the mantle of Elijah who had just gone up into heaven in a chariot of of fire, and he took Elijah's mantle and slapped the Jordan River, and it parted. That was a great miracle. It wasn't the greatest miracle of all, though. What about when Jesus fed the 5,000, or Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, or the Holy Spirit fell upon the Christians at Pentecost, or Peter raising a lady named Dorcas from the dead in the city of Joppa? We'll be going there this January to the place where that area where that took place. What about Paul when he was on the island of Malta? A a viper grabbed hold of him and bit into his arm and his hand, and he just kind of shook it off. That's the kind of staff member I want right there, amen? I want a John Wayne staff. I don't want a wimpy staff member, amen? I don't want somebody who gets a sniffle has to stay home. I want somebody that can bit, bit by a snake, shake it off in the fire, and keep hauling the wood, amen? That's a great miracle. But it wasn't the greatest miracle of all. And I want to say this to you. The virgin birth is a great miracle. It wasn't the greatest miracle of all. The sinless life of Jesus was a great miracle. But it wasn't the greatest miracle of all. Even the death of Jesus. It was miraculous what happened there. All of our sins atoned for. But that was not the greatest miracle of all. You say, Brother Steve, you're getting really close to blasphemy. No, I'm not. I'm getting really close to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest miracle of all. That Jesus died. He was crucified, but he died. And he went into the grave. And there was no grave that could hold his body down. On that third day, he came out of the grave. Look at me. Every other hero of every other holy book is as dead as a hammer, but Jesus is alive. Amen? He is alive. He is alive. And that is good news. Last week I talked about the cross of Jesus. This week I'm talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And all of Christianity hinges on the fact that there is an empty tomb there in Jerusalem where Jesus rose bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave. 
Let's look at the resurrection of Jesus. The first thing I would say to you is this. The resurrection of Jesus is essential for your regeneration. If you want to know God, if you want to have all of your sins forgiven, if you want to be, as the Bible says in John 3, born again, if you want to become a new creation in Jesus Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, then it is mandatory, it is necessary that Jesus had to have risen from the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, nobody could get saved. Paul said in verse 1, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. Paul was a preacher. Oh, he was a missionary. Oh, he was an author. He was all these other. He was a healer and all that. But he was a preacher of the gospel. And we studied what he preached. Even last week he said, I preached the cross of Christ. As we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void or empty. Paul healed people, cast out demons, performed miracles, but his primary ministry was preaching the gospel. And he reminds the people of that here in verse 1. And then he says, it's the gospel, Corinthians, which you are also received. You receive the gospel. You have to accept the gospel. The, the gospel doesn't just come on you. You have to say yes to the gospel. The Lord will knock on your door, but He won't throw the door open. Jesus won't save you without you receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Corinthians had received the gospel and Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The Bible says in John 1, 12, as many as receive Him, talking about Jesus, to them He gives the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. And He goes on to say in verse 1, in which you also stand. Notice how stabilizing the gospel is. And by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now look at verse 3. He gives the three primary, central components of the good news of Jesus in verses 3 and 4. He said, for I delivered unto you, here's the content now, of first importance, that which I also received. You received it, I received it, and when you receive it, you share it, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He's thinking about texts like Psalm 22. Or the psalmist said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quoted that while he was dying. He's thinking about Isaiah 53. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But God, the Lord, laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. He's saying it was according to the Scriptures that Jesus would die. Christ died for our sins. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And if you read the last part of Isaiah 53, it talks about the fact that God, who had just slain the Messiah, would raise him from the dead. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was buried to prove that he was dead. But three days later, he rose bodily from the grave. It wasn't just his teachings that rose. It wasn't just the ideas that he had given forth. It was Jesus' body that rose from the dead. He rose victoriously. He came out of that grave, as they sang just a moment ago, with the keys of death and hell in his hands. He defeated death. Aren't you glad that Jesus has taken the sting out of death? You know what death is for you now? It's just falling asleep in the Lord. That's all it is. It's not hard to go to sleep. I mean, it's, it's, you can just lay down and go to sleep. Some of you are doing it right now. I mean, come on, you, can, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you know it's easy to sleep, and, and you get to death, and you're so worried about it. Don't worry about it. It's just falling asleep in the arms of Jesus and waking up in the arms of Jesus. That's all it is. Jesus took the sting out of death for every Christian. We don't fear death because He has conquered death through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rose victoriously. He rose eternally. A lot of people were raised from the dead, but Jesus rose never to die again. All those other people, Jairus' daughter, the, the woman, the son of the lady at, at Nain, the widow at Nain, and even Lazarus. They all died again, but Jesus has not died again. 
He, he rose eternally. I was sharing all of this this week with a Muslim man. I, I went into a store and asked if he had a product. He said, I don't. And uh, so I was walking out, and the Lord said, do you really think I brought you here to uh, buy that stuff? Why don't you go back and share with him? So I went back and told him, I said, I'm a Christian. And I, I said, can I just share with you what I believe? And he was so polite. He said, sure. And I just shared with him the whole thing. I said, you know, we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, free from a sinful nature. We believe he was tempted in all ways like we are, but he never sinned. And we believe he went to the cross. And we believe that he died, not just a martyr's death, but an atoning death that we might be saved. And we believe that he was buried, but we believe that he was raised from the dead and now he's alive. We believe he appeared to the apostles and to other people and Christians. And then we believe he ascended back to heaven. And we believe he's at the right hand of the Father right now. And we believe that he is preparing heaven for us. He's pardoning lost people and he's getting ready to come back. And we're, we believe that one of these days the sky is going to open up and he's going to be on a white horse and he's going to be coming back. And all of the saints that are with him are going to be coming back with him. And every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that guy's just going like this. I said, we believe all that. And I just wanted you to hear that about Jesus. Let me tell you something, folks. We've got a message that cannot be topped. Amen? You can't go above the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise Him. Amen. Don't, don't just try to do it. Give Him praise. Amen. You won't bother me. I remember an old song that said, hold my mew while I shout. Amen, amen. <laughs> Look at verse 5. And when that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to, most, to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. There it is. We just go to sleep, wake up in the arms of the Lord. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, Paul said, he appeared to me also. He starts giving all these post-resurrection appearances. He said he appear, appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. And it's referred to in Luke chapter 24, verse 34, and also in John chapter 21, verses 15 and following. He appeared to the 12. That was the general name for the apostles. We know that at that time that he appeared to them, Judas was already dead. He had hung himself. And we also know that uh, one of the others was not there. Thomas was not there. But they, Jesus appeared uh, to them at the appropriate time. And then 500 brethren. He appeared to 500 brethren. We know that there are more disciples at that time. Some people say there are only 120 disciples because that's how many there were in the prayer room during the day of Pentecost. But the Bible says here, no, there were at least 500 at one time. I believe there were maybe two or 3,000. We don't know, but there were more than 120 at the prayer meeting on the day of Pentecost. And then he appeared to James. That's the brother of Jesus who would become the senior or the head pastor, the elder, head elder at the church of Jerusalem. This is the only reference to that appearing. Then all of the apostles, that's referred to, I believe, when they were there watching Jesus on the Mount of Olives. We're going there in, in just a couple of months, three months, and and we'll see where Jesus uh, ascended back to heaven. And the Bible talks about that in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It also says in Zechariah 14 that he's coming back to the same place from where he went to heaven. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives, and we'll be on top of that mountain. And then he says, he appeared to me. Last of all, least of all, he appeared to me. And that's when he saw him on the road to Damascus. That's not when he got saved, though. He saw the Lord, and then he was blind for three days, and God sent a soul winner named Ananias, and he shared the gospel with Paul, and he got saved at the house three days later. I love it, on Straight Street. God straightened him out on Straight Street, amen? And I want to tell you, God could get you to Straight Street too, amen? The Bible says in Acts 22, verse 16, Paul was telling about how it happened and what, what Ananias said to him. He said, now, why do you delay, Paul? Get up and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on His name. Paul didn't call on the name of the Lord until he was at the house, and that's when his sins were washed away. But he met the Lord on the road. And then he says in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But he didn't wallow around. And, you know, some people just, you know, say, well, I was just so terrible. I was so terrible. Well, quit talking about that and talk about how good God is. Amen. I mean, don't, don't tell every little detail about how bad you were. That glorifies the sin. Don't do that. Just tell them, you know what, I was really bad. That's all you need to know about that. And Jesus is really good. Let me tell you a lot about that. Brag on the Lord. 
Don't just detail all your sins. I don't need to hear all the the things you did before you got saved. I just want to know, did Jesus save you? And how about it now? Is it, is it working for you? By the grace of God, he said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I. I don't get any of the glory, he said, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we preach and so you believed. It is essential for your regeneration, that you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You cannot get saved and deny that Jesus rose from the dead. The gospel is that Jesus died for you according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried to prove that He was dead, and that God raised Him from the dead. And you have to believe all of that. And let me say this to you. A lot of people, and I, I'm all for anybody talking about Jesus, but you have not had a gospel conversation unless you share verbally the content of the gospel, and that is Jesus died for you, and Jesus rose from the dead, and He wants to save you. If you don't say that, you might have had a little talk about Jesus, but you didn't have a gospel conversation until you give a gospel presentation and until you give a gospel invitation, would you like to receive Jesus Christ? It's essential for our regeneration. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been born again? Have you ever received Christ? We're going to give you that opportunity in just a moment. In fact, let me just tell you, if you want to go ahead and get saved while I'm preaching, come on down. Amen. That wouldn't bother me. Would it bother you? I don't, I, you know, who says you got to get saved at the end? Just get saved right now. That's cool. Do it. Just come on. Not bothering me. Number two, Jesus' resurrection is essential for your resurrection. Bethany just sang a song about ain't no grave going to hold my body down. Apart from Jesus' return, everybody in this room is going to die. You say, well, thank you for blessing me with that. I, I know it's coming, but I just don't like to hear about it. It's kind of like April the 15th, we'll be here. Don't, don't, you know, it's worse than that. When you die, what is death? It's just all it is is your soul and spirit leaving your body. That's all death is. That's it. I just defined you death. All these people say, what is death? What is, uh, it's no big deal. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's a big deal, but I mean, it's not hard to figure out. It's your soul and your spirit leave your body you've seen a dead person, you know something's missing. It's their soul. It's their spirit. It's gone. And if they don't know the Lord, it's going to be in hell. If they know the Lord, going to be in paradise with the Lord. There is no other option. There is no cessation of spirit. You don't die like a, a dog. Dog doesn't have a soul. It's amazing to me how many people today want to take care of all the animals. And I'm all for taking care of the animals. But I want to tell you something. We need to take care of people. We need to take care of human beings because you've got a soul. You've you got, you got a spirit that's going to live forever. I know I just really messed somebody up. You mean my dog, Fluffy's not going to be in heaven? No, Fluffy's not going to be in heaven, all right? I'm sorry. I don't want any letters about that either, all right? I can see Drew, get back on point, get back in the Word. Okay, verse 12, now if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, this is the obvious conclusion, not even Christ has been raised. You guys think about that? You see these Greeks in Corinth, they were all, you know, in the intellectual, nothing wrong with loving God with your mind, but you need to love Him also with your heart and soul first, and then with your mind and your strength. I think the wording there is explicit. I even know where it is. I'm not trying to brag, but it's in Mark 12, 30. Jesus said it. Love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6. And so, I believe that when you love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, Christ is being preached, that He's been raised from the dead. These Greeks said, no, the body, when it dies, th there's no good thing in the body. It's just the spirit of man. It's just the soul of man that's, that is sacred. And Jesus is saying, 
And Paul is saying, no, no, Jesus proved that the body is also important. Your body is going to rise from the dead. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. It is empty. We're giving people a false hope. Your faith also is vain. There's nothing to believe in. If Jesus gave us, is just another religious teacher that gave us a bunch of rules and religion. How many of you know that the world has enough religion? We need a relationship with the living God. Jesus didn't come just to give you a religion. Jesus gave you a relationship with a living God. Jesus came to bridge the gap that you could never bridge through religion or do, doing good works. He came to give you life. That's why he came. And he had to rise from the dead to give you that resurrection life. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if, in fact, the dead are not raised. He's just making his point here. If there's no resurrection, then we're just a bunch of liars out here because everywhere we go, we preach that Jesus not only died, but he rose from the dead. If that's not true, we're all preaching lies. Then he went on to say in verse 16, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. It is futile. It is useless, vain, empty, foolish. You are still in your sins. And our beloved brethren who have already died, same thing for them. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they have perished. They're in hell. There's nothing we can do for them. If Christ has not been raised, all of us are lost. We have no hope. And then he says in verse 19, a verse that we really can't really understand because we've always had it so easy when it comes to Christianity. But there were so many people at this time when Paul was writing to the Corinthians that were Christians that were being persecuted by the Jews, persecuted by the Romans, and so if they didn't have a hope of an afterlife that was paradise, why would they live for Christ and get all this persecution? I mean, if you're just going to die, why suffer during your life? He says it in verse 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, if this is all there is to it, we are of all men most to be pitied. We have suffered for preaching the gospel. We've been beaten. We've been tried. We've been embarrassed. We've been thrown in jail. And so many other of our brethren have as well. You know, when I think about some of the Christians, what they have to go through to go to church, I got news for you. They wouldn't stay away from church just because they had a headache. They wouldn't stay away from the church just because some of them go through and they risk their very lives. I, I was telling somebody up there when I was baptized, I said, you know what? There are a lot of people today that if they get baptized in a communist country, they will be thrown in jail. If you even proclaim the name of Jesus. And in some countries, you can be killed. Do you realize how easy we've got it? Do you realize what he's saying there? He said, but they didn't have it easy. He said, if all we have is this life, we of all people are most to be pitied. And he, you're, you're just about to say, well, Paul, can you give us any hope? He said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Here it comes, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Glory to the living God. The first fruits of those who are asleep. He's the, because he was raised all of us are going to be raised, and the Bible says this, His resurrection, He's the first fruits. it guarantees ours. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, then we're going to die just like an animal, and there's going to be nothing to our future. In a hundred years, we'll just be bones and dust in a box. But because Jesus rose from the dead, my mother and daddy are not dead, they are alive. My little brother that I never even knew about. He was born uh, just, just right. He was born like a, a month early and he died. I never met him. 
I'm going to meet him one of these days because Jesus rose from the dead. I want to say this to you, friend, because Jesus has risen from the dead. We're all going to, all of us that know Jesus, going to get to see Dr. Rogers again. Amen. We're going to get to see Billy Graham again. We're going to get to see Moses. We're going to get to see all. But the main thing is we're going to get to see God Almighty through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, because God has been raised. Jesus, he had raised Jesus from the dead. And so we can be raised too. And no grave has the final say over our bodies. It's essential for your resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus is. The resurrection of Jesus is also essential for Jesus' return. Next year, 2020, I'm preaching all the way through the book of Revelation on Sunday morning. And we're going to talk about the coming of the Lord. And without the resurrection, there was no ascension, and there's no sitting at the right hand of the Father, and there's no preparing heaven, and there's no coming back to this earth. There's no second coming. There's no return of Jesus without the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 50. Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's just the, the, the fluttering, the flittering of an eye. Just as an eye will flutter. That, that's just what it is. It's going to be that quick. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Same thing in 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have died, my mom, my dad, their spirit and their soul already with the Lord, those bodies are going to shoot out of that grave. I don't care what kind of the condition they were buried in, if they're buried at sea or whatever, it's all coming back together, and it's going to be a brand new body. It's going to be a brand new resurrected body, and it's going to be reunited with soul and spirit there, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord, because Jesus rose from the dead. Behold, I tell you, a mystery will not all sleep, will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable, talking about his body, must put on the imperishable. How many of you know that your body is perishing? Does anybody know that? Would you just give me an amen? I mean, come on. It ain't what it used to be, is it, all right? But praise God, it's not what it's going to be. Praise the Lord. It's going to be better. This perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he just starts taunting them with the Old Testament Scripture. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then he could not go back to heaven. He could not prepare heaven. He could not sit at the right hand of the Father until the Father makes all of his enemies a footstool for his feet. He could not intercede for all of us every day. Jesus is praying for you right now. But if he's not raised from the dead, he's not doing that because he's not in heaven anymore. If Jesus is somewhere dead over in Jerusalem, then he has not been raised from the dead and Jesus cannot come back. If he was never raised from the dead, he didn't go back to heaven and he can't come back. But hear me, he has been raised from the dead. He did go back to heaven. He is in heaven right now. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. He's on his throne. And look at me. He is coming back. When God says he's coming back, he will return. And every eye will see him, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is coming back because he rose from the dead. Muhammad's not coming back. Buddha's not coming back. Allah's not coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he's not coming to take sides. He's not coming to win an election. He's coming back to take over. And this world will be his kingdom. Jesus' resurrection is essential for your regeneration. It's essential for your resurrection. It's essential for Jesus' return. And it's essential for your reward. I hear people sometimes say, Brother Steve, I don't care about the reward stuff. I just want to get in. 
I just want to get to heaven. I hear you. But you know, it wouldn't be bad to enjoy it a little bit, okay? And I don't know if this means something. I, I, I don't know how many times I've been asked. Well, some people have bigger and better houses than others. I don't know how it's going to work. But I can tell you this, some folks are going to enjoy heaven more than others. Now, everybody's going to be glad they're not in hell. Amen? But the Bible says that some are building right now with hay, wood, and stubble. Others are with brick and mortar and all that kind of stuff and stone. Some of you are walking with the Lord and some of you are not. You've, if you've been saved, some of you are just, I don't know how to say it, you're more obedient. You're, oh, you're preaching works. I am not. I'm preaching Bible. And there is a reward for obeying the Lord for Christians. And there's a punishment for not. I don't understand it, but all of your works are going to be held up against the fire of the Lord. You know, Jesus has fiery eyes. He's going to look at your works, and I personally believe that the ones that are not of Him are going to burn up. But everything you did, are you ready for this? Not just for the Lord, but you did it for the glory of God. You didn't do it to get your name in a bulletin. You didn't do it for somebody to see. You did it just for the glory of God. You served the Lord. You ministered to people. You shared the gospel. You served people. You helped people. You were kind to people. And you did it just for the glory of God. And God says, I'm going to look at you. And I'm going to say, well done. Well done. 1 Corinthians 3 13 through 15, but on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if it's a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. What he's saying is, if you're out there and you got saved and you're not really living for the Lord, yes, you'll go to heaven, but you're going to smell like smoke while you're there. Amen? Don't you want to have God's reward? Then look at this verse. Look at verse 58. There, let's read it with me. Read it off the screen. Everybody read it with me, good and strong. One of the greatest verses in the Bible, and it ought to really encourage you to serve the Lord. Read it with me now. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus is essential for your reward. And I'm so grateful that Jesus died for my sins. I'm so grateful that he stayed on that cross until he could say, it is finished, paid in full. I'm so grateful that he would go through the process of allowing himself to be buried. But I'm so grateful that on that first Easter morning, he rose from the dead. And that is essential for your regeneration. It's essential for your resurrection. It's essential for His return. And one of these days, it's going to be essential for your reward. And He will say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank the Lord for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's thank Him for it right now. Amen.